we begin with our opening song, Gathered Here, that's played by our beloved Sheila Kalori. Good morning. As we begin, we wish to acknowledge that the land on which most of us live and on which our church building is located is Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Metis, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge that traditional lands recognition is an important first step towards reconciliation and justice. We encourage everyone to examine what we can do individually and in community to create an equitable relationship with our First Nations neighbors. One small step, but I think an important one, is to learn the pronunciation of indigenous place names. Edmonton's name in the Cree language is Amiskwatsi Muskaigan, meaning Beaver Mountain House. Recently, our city wards have received new indigenous names. Ward 10, where our church building is located, is now called E.P. Kokani Piotsi, meaning the traditional lands where the Blackfoot Nation performed buffalo browns. My own Ward 8 is called Papas Teo, after a highly respected leader of the Papas Chase Band. It also means large woodpecker. You can find all ward names on the website of the City of Edmonton. My name is Trudy Greenauer and my pronouns are she, her. I am your service leader this morning. Our speaker is our minister, the Reverend Ann Barker. Musicians are Sheila Killoran and Rebecca Pedersen. And we will have a video created by guest artists, Liz James and Ilara Stefanio Godet. Heather McLean Smith made the Solstice Candle video and technical wizardry for Zoom is provided by Brenda Jackson and Bill Lee. We especially welcome you if you are new to Westwood or have not been able to attend one of our online services before today. We welcome you if you're feeling lonely today. May you be uplifted and find connection in this shared space. We welcome you if you're feeling troubled or ill at ease today, we hope our time together brings you comfort. We welcome you if you're hopeful today or cautiously pessimistic or entirely not hopeful. Today, we will light our first solstice advent candle of hope. We welcome you wherever you are, as you are. You may find many persuasions among Unitarian Universalists, Buddhists like myself, humanists, pagans, Christians, atheists and agnostics, and many folks who prefer not to settle on any label. We search for truth everywhere. Some of our sources include the teachings of earth-based religions, words and deeds of prophetic people, and wisdom from the world's religions. However, the first and foremost source is our own direct experience. And so you are invited to reflect on your own experience with our monthly theme, hunger, as we come to the end of this month. Maybe especially in this time of physical distancing and so much uncertainty, we notice that we are hungry, thirsty, yearning, whether for physical community and family visits, spiritual nourishment, economic security, or a space to grieve our losses and be comforted. What are you 
hungry for? What are you still hungry for? My name is Ann Barker and my pronouns are she and her. Our chalice lighting words this morning. So let's gather our chalices. are by Sherry Woodbury and are entitled In the Circle Again. Here we are in our circle again, a circle of vision and reflection, a forum for deciding and empowering. Here we are at the base of another bridge, another space spanning the shores of today and tomorrow, beckoning, beckoning us to cross the chasm one day at a time. Here we are gathered again at the cusp of the future at the boundary that holds community together. Here we are in the circle of love and trust brought to this moment by a series of choices and promises, by hope and gratitude, by our own shadows faced and befriended. With a servant's heart and a leader's listening, with a parent's love, truer than all our inner trembling, let us model the health we seek for all and lean into community. Somewhere out there, all that we dream is possible. Somewhere in here, we are sowing the seeds. So we light our chalices this morning in the spirit of creation for this is a place where seeds are planted. And so we choose to be intentional so that the seeds we plant bring, bring benefit to those who follow. At this time in our service, we pause to reflect on our week. We recall the milestones, joys, concerns, and sorrows, the changes in our lives, as well as people who need our compassion and healing thoughts. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. I invite you now to type your concern or celebration into the chat while Sheila will play meditation on breathing. As this is the last service of the month, we will acknowledge all November birthdays. If you or a family member have a birthday this month, please note that in the chat as well.
I light one final candle for all the unspoken concerns, joys and sorrows, hunger and gratitude that we carry in our hearts. Please join me in the words of our affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. We are entering Advent, the season of anticipation, the marking of time leading up to an expected event. Here at Westwood, we mark the weeks leading up to the winter solstice, the turning of the earth, which places us at the farthest angle from the sun, the shortest day and the longest night of the year. The candle of hope represents the resilience of humanity through life's challenges and trials. The candle is lit in the direction of east, the place of new beginnings, the breath of fresh air. Together, we work toward a world where all living beings may experience safety and security, beauty and promise. And we help each other to remain hopeful when this work is hard. I happen to be facing east. If you want to take a moment to figure out where east is in your home, then you can remember during the week, the candle of hope. And I invite you to reflect on what hope means to you as we now light this Advent candle. Thank you, Heather, for the candle. Westwood thrives from offerings of money, time, and talent. Every Sunday, we reflect on this offering, knowing that the act of giving is as essential to our spiritual well being as anything else we do here on Sunday mornings. Pledges of money build our budget to fund our staff, building programs and ministries, including Zoom, and you can see our e transfer information on the screen. Pledges of volunteer service are equally important for everything we do as a community. Thank you for your contribution. Today we have a short video from our minister highlighting some of the special ways we are safely able to connect and to contribute this December. I'm Ann Barker, minister at Westwood Unitarian, and I'm here to talk about December events and activities. We have done a bunch of work to adapt many of our beloved traditions and activities and events to Zoom so that we can still be together, have what's precious to us and shape it with new meaning for this complicated time. So we want you to know that the slate is full and that there are people ready and uh, able to help and serve you in this time. On December 13th, Sarah McEwen and I are hosting a blue Christmas service because we know that this is a vulnerable season to begin with, even though it's full of joy and beauty, it also amplifies our losses and um, lifts up difficulties for people. And this year is harder than ever. So we want you to come and be nurtured and nourished in this tender space that recognizes that this season can be complicated. On December 20th, Rebecca Patterson is hosting a carol sing. She's invited you to nominate your favorite carols on the Sundays between now and then. And she will select a whole bunch of them and record them and you'll have a surprise carol sing on the morning of the 20th. On the 27th, the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's is traditionally our pancake breakfast. And Deborah, Glenn, and Brenda Jackson are adapting it to be an online bring your own pancakes kind of breakfast where it will be social and informal but also meaningful. There'll be fun music, all kinds of good things. So we want you to come and see the surprises that are in store for you with these things. But I skipped December 21 and that's winter solstice and let's talk about that for a minute. Our winter solstice service online uh, will not be recorded. It's just like in person, you have to be there to be able to attend. It's a one-time deal. 
And it has some magical, beautiful things that are going to happen. Some things we can't do when we're in person that we can do online. It's going to be full of surprises. And your solstice team has created a beautiful little kit for you that they want you to have before the solstice service. It's called your Winter Solstice Comfort and Connection Package. And it has items reminiscent of solstice in person, but also treasures and things you will not have thought of that will surprise you. We really want to get that in your hand. So on December 6th, which would be our next front lawn social, we're adapting because of health guidance that tells us to minimize physical contact. We're adapting to have stations on the front lawn. So if you're someone who brings your recycling for Skip the Depot, or you're bringing quilt squares or knit or crochet squares for our projects, you can bring them to those stations on the day. We'll have a station collecting items of comfort and warmth for the neighbor center. The neighbor center supports people living in vulnerable circumstances on the south side of Edmonton. And we've been collecting hats and scarves and ski mitts and socks and blankets and warm coats and things um, for eight years now. And we'd love to keep doing that. If you aren't able to contribute on that day, we invite you to make your own contributions to agencies around the city because all of the agencies could use a hand right now. So whatever works in your budget and your, in your ability. So you can drop recycling, squares, uh, items for the neighbor center. You can pick up your winter solstice comfort and connection kit. And if you're more comfortable staying in your car, then we are happy to come out and have you pop the trunk and we'll pick up what you've brought and put your solstice package in there for you. There's one per household. If you've got a Westwood friend you know can't make it and you would like to take and deliver theirs, we appreciate the help. We'll do our best to deliver the rest of them in the days that follow. Um, during the solstice service, the Norwood uh, Child and Family Centre has been named as our um, as our charity for this year. So we'll be recommending a contribution to them too, if you want to keep that in mind or plan for your budget. And that'll happen on the 21st. What we really want to say is we know we're in this together. And it's so important to be connected in whatever ways it works, whether it's um, a brief spotting of one another at the front yard drive-by event, or it's longer visits on Zoom, it's coming to a service or to an event, it's a phone call, it's a check-in. We will carry one another through this time. We're here. We're so glad you're here too. Take good care, everyone. We love you. Thank you, Anne. Each of us receives from the shared wealth of our offering and our wider community is also strengthened. Rebecca Pedersen will now lead us in song to give thanks for this. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together We play that song every Sunday, from you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, and there is no time that it has been truer than the season that we're in right now. Each of us will know hunger, the physical kind, the psychological, the spiritual, hunger for the practical, like food and shelter, hunger for belonging, like family, friendship, and love, Hunger for achievement, learning, accomplishing, or acquiring, and hunger for the ineffable, ineffable, the things that are difficult to pinpoint, and yet we know are still lurking, often just out of reach. We've spent November reflecting on hunger as a theme, asking what are we hungry for, reflecting on the endless and often conflicting ways that we can be hungry for peace and justice, and then the hunger to be known and held in community, this time from the Jewish perspective. Now on this final Sunday of November, we ask, what is the hunger that remains? And let me explain what I mean by that. I believe that within each of us, there are essential gems that sustain us through our lives. 
what sustains you may bear little resemblance to what sustains me or the person in the window next to you. But what is common between us is that we each have these treasures within us and these treasures are what we use to make sense of the world. What do you use to make sense of the world? How do you take in information? How do you sort it? How do you identify the things that will help you and differentiate them from the things that will hurt you? You may find it odd, but I was way older than I should have been before I understood that people think and process information differently than I do. I knew that people had different ideas and different tastes and that I like that I love tomatoes, but my brother hated them, even though at the same time, ketchup was pretty much his favorite food. My parents and my brothers were keen team sports people, and I would rather bury my nose in a book or create something with my hands. The physical activities that could hold my attention were individual, swimming or cycling, where the movement was for joy and non-competitive which was pretty much the opposite of them. And I attributed these differences to taste. I didn't understand that there were differences between being independent or group oriented, between being social or solitary, between being impulsive and thoughtful. It was a long time before I understood that the learning that came so easily to me in school was different for other people that my friend who seemed to hate school was actually struggling with learning challenges and struggling to follow the information in the way that it was presented. So she perpetually felt lost and left behind, that a different manner of working with information could change everything for her and eventually would. Some years later than this, another friend would say to me in frustration one day, do you always have an answer? Well, of course I did. That's how brains work, right? I didn't understand yet then that some people wanted time to think about an idea before they formed an answer. This may sound ridiculous now, but I really didn't. That was completely foreign, even shocking to me at the time. It was amazing to me to learn that some people were internal processors or that they were privately reflective that some people were exhausted being around people rather than energized by it, that it wasn't a preference for some, but that it was their actual core way of being, that being alone was a way to make sense of the world, that a discussion or a debate would interfere with reflection rather than enhance it. So how do you make sense of the world? What do you need? to make a decision? How do you know when something is certain or is still in question? When I lead trainings for officiants, there is a lot of information to take in, but one of the most important things that they need to know is how they work. How much lead time do they need to feel comfortable? Can they easily make changes on the fly? Or, or are they comfortable that, like, then you would be comfortable that the scaffolding is holding the structure? Or do they need all the T's crossed and the I's dotted well in advance so that they can maintain a steady form? How do you work? How do you prepare? How do you manage your feelings? How do you handle an interruption? There are all kinds of variables that happen in any ceremony. What matters is that you have the right tools that you need to deal with them. And the toolkit is different, chaplain to chaplain. What are your tools, the knowledge and beliefs that help you in a pinch? When the world went sideways last March, remember the scurry to the store to stock up on supplies? That's a toolkit response. And it might have been, I'll feel better prepared, stocked up on what I foresee needing. Or it could have been, 
I don't have a way to deal with this situation, so this is my panicked response. Or any number of other ways of managing in life. They look the same in the store. But one is tied to something that you know about yourself, and the other is tied to not knowing. The gems that we carry inside of us, the unique collection of wisdom and being that form our own ways of interacting with the world, don't necessarily fix all of the problems. They don't stop the pandemic from coming, but they do contain the clues to the processes that will help us to get through with as much well being as possible. How we prepare food is a good example. Even if each of us in this Zoom room today were given the exact same ingredients and the same kitchen to work in, what we do next comes from what we know, what we want, what we believe, and what we understand. If you don't like tomatoes, I don't understand that, but if you don't like tomatoes, you might leave them out. Or you'll use them anyway because not being wasteful is more important to you than food preference. Or you'll include them because they are your guest's favorite or because they remind you of your grandma. What matters to you? What do you believe makes for a good decision, for a good person? What is your place in the world? What do you need to feel safe and content and whole? What reassures you when you feel rocky? What reinforces you when you need strength? What comforts you when you feel lost? This is the work we do in religious community, not to have one another live out the exact same lives, but to help one another find our own unique ways. A story by Teresa Honey Youngblood, a credentialed religious educator and the family ministry coordinator for Soul Matters. It's entitled The Growing Season. The six-year-old and the nine-year-old Co-creators of our neighborhood garden this past spring and summer survey the backyard plot after our first good hard frost. Oh, that's a lot of dead stuff, says one. Guess we're done here, says the other. They make their way to the far corner where a drooping pumpkin vine has revealed a few small orange orbs that we had missed in previous pickings. I stand over a daunting patch of blackened dahlias. The dying back shows evidence of our months of enthusiasm, but also horticultural ineptitude. Trowels and forks here and there, lost these past weeks, maybe months, until the weeds that obscured them were laid low. Heaps of too tall flowers that grew leggy for inadequate sunshine, then flopped over into barely discernible paths. Twisted, odd angled stems of cabbages and collards planted too shallow, mats of green mush where crowded lettuces succumbed to the cold, bare soil. soil. I see so much we could have done differently, so many mistakes made in haste, so many times I chose not to weed, so many corners cut, and no way to do them over until the next spring. How many seasons does a gardener get? 10, 20, 30 maybe, depending on when they start. This finitude makes the regret over missed opportunities and poorer choices all the keener. There is relief and remorse equally in my heart as the growing season comes to a close. Then the nine-year-old is at my side again, attempting mightily to whisper through excitement, look, look, and I look where they are pointing. There I see a trio of gold finches, finches, annual migrants from more northern climes, hanging upside down to better reach the seeds in the gracefully nodding brown heads of spent sunflowers. And just below that, on a bright tithonia blossom, a monarch. Somehow, both butterfly, flower and butterfly spared from the cold snap. 
the insect is lingering over the precious late season nectar, even as gray clouds gather overhead. I think for a moment how this weedy chaos, those beds of failed attempts look to the wild things. It looks like food. It looks like shelter. Imperfect, but earnestly done with best efforts, tools on hand, and our collective wisdom such as it was, it looks like a place of giving. Children and grown-ups, and creation itself was tended here and fed. The treasures within us shape how we read the story. The wisdom that we claim helps us find the seeds among the rubbish. The beliefs we nurture keep us planting, even when we think we are inept. Our first story was about doubt and connecting to faith. Our second story is a film about hope and connecting to love. Let me introduce you. The words originate from Liz James. It is her voice you will hear. The art comes from our own Elara Stefanik Godet. It is their vision you will see. An atheist and a theist woven together in sacred art. Liz writes to the listeners of this piece, if my description of no God perfectly describes God to you, you can go ahead and substitute that in your heart or out loud if you need. I've been substituting in my head when I sing Amazing Grace for years. We can all share the words and all their meanings. I have faith in us. I give you hope and oranges. They've got God and I've got no God. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying they have a thing and I don't. I'm saying they have a thing and I have a different thing. I'm saying there are as many no gods as there are gods, and let me tell you about mine. My no god is endlessly practical. She wears comfortable shoes and a fanny pack stocked with all kinds of things, but not everything you'll need. A promise of everything you'll need in a world where people starve to death is a message as tippy and false and tall as four-inch heels. No God is done with that kind of push-up bra control top pantyhosey message. She will not tell you that everything happens for a reason, no matter how great your need. No matter if you are standing at the kitchen sink in the harsh light of sunrise with a morning after dryness in your chest from a night overrun with a forest fire of grief. No matter if you are ashy and tender inside like you could blow away, no god would not tell you that all will be well. She would not make that kind of judgment call. Instead, she would tell you that what you have is what you have, and even when you are ashy and tender and blowing away, the sunrise is a miracle and you can look up and see it if you want. No god does believe in miracles. In a world with sunrises and babies and leaves that turn color, how could she not? No god doesn't bother with makeup, of course, because it changes the way the wind off the ocean feels against her skin. Sunscreen, sure, because no god believes in cancer and in bad things happening to good people and in mortality. No god does not believe in an afterlife, so she doesn't have to be distracted by packing for it. Instead, she pays attention to what's in front of her because she loves being alive, like life is an orange plucked straight from the tree. When no god eats the orange, she is as messy as a two-year-old's hug after breakfast, sticky everywhere. No god knows you can juice oranges, of course, and sip them delicately out of pretty glasses, but she will have none of that. She is not an orange vampire taking just the parts that slide smoothly into stemware. She is not in the business of sorting living things into piles. No god throws nothing away. She doesn't believe in a way, only in other types of here. No god is a chewer of things, and oranges are no exception. She wants the feel of the pulp on her tongue and the fiber in her belly. 
She wants the mess on her cheeks, a stickiness that she can wear like laugh lines or a memoir, that announces to the world, I ate an orange today, how lucky am I? She wants to peel it herself too, so she can be there for that satisfying moment when the smooth pores yield under her nail and invite her in, so she can watch the way the tiny bits of orange mist shoot up into the air like fireworks. She wants to feel the mist land softly on the skin of her hands, where she will carry the memory of it with her all day. When no god eats the orange, she saves the peels. She will dry them and mix them with flower petals to carry the smell of summer through the winter. She'll save the seeds, too, because seeds are the closest thing to heaven that she knows. Infinite life in a finite world. And they fit in her fanny pack. No god may or may not have created the orange tree. She can't be certain because she can't remember back that far, and neither can you, so she's not sure what the point is of discussing it all. No god is deeply practical. The orange trees are here now, and they're beautiful, and that's enough for her. And she loves them, and she loves you. But not in a personal, promise-making kind of way. This is not a proposal. She's not down on one knee. She doesn't tell you she has a specific plan for your unfolding, sheltered in her love. She prefers to stick to the plain facts. And the plain facts are these. You do not need love from God or from no God, because love is a thing sown into your cells like the trees and fruit are sown into the cells of the orange seed. Humans cannot help but love, and they cannot help but be loved. When there is not a God to love us, we find one another and we offer and we receive and we unfold and we struggle and we hang on for dear life and it is peels and pulp flying everywhere and it's beautiful and you don't need to worry about whether you can do it because the truth is you can do nothing else. The scent of loving and being loved is all over your hands like orange mist and you will smell it when you raise your hand to brush the hair out of your eyes, which you should because the world is worth seeing. There is planting to be done. There are seeds, saved in a fanny pack, now being pressed into your sticky, love-scented palm with the simplest and most honest of benedictions, which is, here, I save these for you. For you. To carry in your pocket like rosary beads until the right piece of ground appears between your toes like an unresolved cord and you feel life opening for more life. And you crouch down and whisper those seeds into the earth, saying, Here, I saved these for you. Love is a thing sown into your cells, like the trees and fruit are sown into the cells of the orange seed. Humans cannot help but love, and they cannot help but be loved. And you don't need to worry about whether you can do it, because the truth is, you can do nothing else. The hunger that remains at the end of the day is to feed our center to find or to create and then to follow our compass. Not alone, not in isolation, but rather in the company of those who challenge you, who know you, who will help you find your own path through so that you might be uniquely ourselves together. Blessed be and amen. Let's take a brief moment of silence before we go to our last song. Our closing song today is Our World is One World, again played by Sheila Killor.
and the benediction once more. There is planting to be done. There are seeds saved in a fanny pack now being pressed into your sticky love scented palm with the simplest and most honest of benedictions, which is here, I saved these for you, for you to carry in your pocket like rosary beads until the right piece of ground appears between your toes like an unresolved cord and you feel life opening for more life and you crouch down and you whisper those seeds into the earth saying, here, I saved these for you. <laughs>